out some oldies but goodies here so <laughs> great is your faithfulness so oh
have a seat. Hey guys. So, we are going to talk about in our service, we've been talking a little bit about a big journey that Paul and Barnabas are making. Have you guys ever gone on a big journey or a big trip? Where'd you go? I went on a hike. You went on a hike? Ooh, that's fun. What did you bring along with you on that hike? You brought water. Yeah, you got to stay hydrated. That's right. Did you wear good hiking shoes? Kind of. Kind of. Could have been better. If you have been better supplied. So, on this big journey, Paul and Barnabas, they're going on a big old hike because here's the thing. We know the church, and there's churches all over the world today, but back in their day, you see this small little circle that was the only places where the church was. Out of this whole big world, it was only right within that little pink circle right there. And their job, their mission, was to bring this gospel, this good news, the news about Jesus, talk about Jesus, to everywhere, everywhere that they could go. And so, we've made a map for you guys, right? This little pink circle is that big picture right there. What I want you guys to do as we're thinking, and as we're going through this service today, is think about what are the things that Paul and Barnabas would need to bring along with them? What are the things that they might encounter? What are the people and the animals and the places and the cities? And I want you to draw it on that map. Sound good? So, parents, feel free. This is theirs to color on and to do what they want to, but feel free to take, clear, clear this off, put, take that big picture, throw it on here, and you guys can fill in that map. All right? Sounds good. All right, I'm going to keep going over to the big kids and helping them figure out what we're talking about as well. So I'll see what you guys get to create. All right, Christ Church, it's been wonderful to praise, to, to glorify God and, and for everything he is. And now I invite you to join with me in a prayer of confession. Dear Father, as we gather together as we sing about your praise, as we approach you and turn our hearts and our eyes to you. Lord, we are humbled in the comparison, in the presence of your glory and of your might and of the contemplation of your good purposes and perfection. Lord, we realize that we do not measure up to what you've called us to do. You, we do not measure up to the level of perfection that you created us to be. And so, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. And we ask for healing in the places where we have sinned, in the places where we have hurt ourselves, our family members, our friends, our neighbors, and the world around us. And Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit, that as we come and ask for your forgiveness, as we come in repentance, that you would create in us a new heart, one that knows of your love that knows of your care and desire both for us and for all of the people around us. And Lord, help us to act in that manner. Help us to love the people that we go to work with, that we go to school with, the people that we live each day in interaction with. Father, we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Christ Church, hear these words of assurance that our God, as we come, as we ask for forgiveness, he's not a God who sits on the throne waiting to judge us as we form in a queue and come to him. No, God, God paints himself as a picture of a father waiting. And the moment that he sees us, he comes running to us. Before we've said a word, before we can stamp out any apology, and he assures us first and foremost that he loves us. And there is nothing we can do that changes that. And so when we come for, to ask for forgiveness, we come not to a, a God who is going to judge us, who is going to punish us, but a God who says whatever is needed to have happen to make this right, to, to justify you, I have taken upon myself. And we live our lives now in that assurance and in that freedom. And so I invite you in this next song to contemplate the good news that is the gospel. to 
We're going to take our five-minute break, so we ask that you do what you need to do, spend some time in prayer, talk and say hello to your neighbor, whatever else that might be, and we'll see you back in five minutes.
All right, as you guys are headed back to your seats, a um, couple announcements. So one, right after the service today, we will have what is scheduled to be our final membership class. And so if you would like to know more about what does it mean to be a member of Christ Church, would like to engage in that process of recommitting to membership at Christ Church, I invite you to be a part of that class after the service today. And if you were unable to make it, if you've un been unable to make the other ones and you would like to, let me know. I would love to meet with you. Me and, and an elder or a couple of elders will figure out a time that works for you. We will do come to you, not make you come to us. So I'd love to have you do that. The other one is then we're also doing a family movie night on July 8th at 6.30 p.m. here at Christ Church. So I invite you to come to that. Invite your friends, invite your neighbors, or just come yourself, whatever works. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. All right. Well, the movie is The Prince of Egypt. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed, yes, blast from the past. <laughs> All right, so now in our service, we have the privilege and honor to install our new deacon and elder into active service in our consistory. And so I would like to invite Keith Ackerman and Samantha Poole up to the front. All right, I'll have you guys stand here. Keith, there's a mic right there for you. Samantha, do you want to grab your microphone? That way they can hear you and your responses. All right. Beloved in the Lord, we have come to install elder and deacon and elder and deacon into Christ's holy church. Christ alone is the source of all Christian ministry through the ages calling men and women to serve. And by the Holy Spirit, all who believe and are baptized receive a ministry to witness to Jesus as Savior and Lord, and to love and serve those with whom they live and work. We, all of us, are ambassadors for Christ, who reconciles and makes us whole. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Following Christ's resurrection and ascension, God has given the church apostles and prophets and teachers, deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, and leadership. We stand within a tradition where God calls and empowers deacons, elders, and ministers of words and sacraments. Those are the three offices within the Reformed Church of America. The congregation has elected the following people to the offices of deacon and elder to be installed as deacon because he has already been ordained previously, Keith Ackerman. And to be installed as elder as she has already been ordained previously, Samantha Pohl. Deacons and elders are called to serve as Christ served, which is a very big calling. We look to them to be people of spiritual commitment, exemplary life, compassionate spirit, and sound judgment. Deacons are set apart for the ministry of mercy, service, and outreach. They gather gifts and offerings, care for them faithfully, and distribute them with wisdom and compassion to persons in need and for the purposes that advance God's kingdom on earth. Deacons visit and comfort the distressed, provide whatever necessities may arise, and assist the congregation at services of worship. Elders are set apart for a ministry of watchful and responsible care for the welfare and order of the church. They have oversight of all members, including one another, the deacons and the ministers, equipping everyone to live in harmony with God's word. They ensure the word of God is rightly proclaimed and taught and the sacraments faithfully administered. Elders assist the ministers with their good counsel and serve all Christians with advice, consolation, and encouragement. Elders and deacons, together with the ministers, Form the consistory to call, lead God's people in proclaiming good news to the poor, righteousness to the nations, and peace among all. The consistory provides for the welfare of the church, the stewardship of property and finance, and the spiritual benefit and growth of all Christ's people. As the three offices of deacon, elder, and minister of word and sacrament are united in Christ, so also the church, in the church one office is not separate from the others. The minister of the word and sacrament, that's me, does not serve without the elder and neither without the deacon. Together, they enable the whole mission of the church. Everything in the church will be done decently and in order when faithful persons are called to office and responsibly fulfill their charge. Brothers and sisters, 
before Almighty God in the presence of this congregation answer sincerely these questions. Do you confess with us and the church throughout the ages your faith in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. I do. do you believe in your heart that you are called by Christ's church and therefore by God to this office? I do. I do. Do you believe the books of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God and the perfect doctrine of salvation, rejecting all contrary beliefs? I do. I do. Will you be diligent in your study of Holy Scripture and in your use of the means of grace? Will you pray for God's people and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living? I, do. I, will. I will. Will you accept the church's order and governance, submitting to ecclesiastical discipline should you become delinquent in either life or doctrine? I will. I will. Oh, boy. Will you be loyal to the witness and work of the Reformed Church in America, using all your abilities to further its Christian mission here and throughout the world? I, I will. will. Keith, as a deacon, will you faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully manifest Christ's love and care, gather and distribute the offerings of God's people, visit and comfort the distressed, minister to the poor and needy, and strive to advance God's reign of justice and peace? I will. Samantha, as elder, will you faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully study God's word, oversee the household of faith, encourage spiritual growth, maintain loving discipline, and provide for the proclamation of the gospel and the celebration of the sacraments? I will. All right. Elder Samantha and Deacon Keith, be faithful in performing your duties. Magnify the one who has called you to these high and holy offices. Be zealous for the church of Christ, hospitable, prudent, upright, devout, and self-controlled. Love goodness, holding always to the mystery of the faith. All right, congregation, members of Christ's church, I ask that you would rise and affirm your covenant with these elders and deacons whom God has given us. I will ask you a series of questions and if you respond positively, please respond with, we do. Beloved in Lord Jesus Christ, do you receive in the name of the Lord these, these deacon and elder as duly elected and ordained servants of Christ? Do you promise to respect them for the sake of the offices for which they have been chosen and ordained? Do you promise to encourage and pray for them, to labor, labor together in obedience to the gospel for unity, purity, and peace of the church, the welfare of the whole world, and the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Beloved people of God, receive this deacon and this elder as Christ's own servants. Support them in love that their work may bear fruit. And so in the name and by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare that this brother and this sister are duly installed as deacon and elder in the church. Together, let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. At this point, ah, you two need to stay up here, though. I'm not done with you yet. I would like to invite any uh, of the otherwise ordained elders and deacons of the greater consistory to come up and to lay hands on these two as we pray for them finish the installation uh you can decide would you like to i think it's fine if you just stand there christ church let us pray almighty and ever loving god you taught us to pray for ourselves and for others and to give thanks for all of life. May every grace of ministry on the, rest on these elders and deacons. Keep them strong and faithful, that your church may prosper in peace. Grant them wisdom, courage, discretion, and benevolence, that they may fulfill their charge to the glory of Jesus Christ. Bestow your grace on this people, that they may support these deacons and elders with your prayer, cooperation, and encouragement to guard them from growing weary and doing what is right. Inspire your whole church with your power, unity, and peace through the Spirit. 
Grant that all who trust you may live together in love. Lead all nations in the way of justice. Direct those who govern. May they be fair, maintain order, support those in need, and defend the oppressed, that the world may know true peace. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy, that by teaching and example others may come to live for you. Comfort and deliver, O Lord, all who are in trouble, sorrow, poverty, sickness, grief. Heal them in body, mind, spirit, or circumstance. Working in them by your grace wanders beyond their dreams and hopes through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray and invite you all to join with me in praying this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Christ Church, let's welcome them into the offices. We've been going through the book of Acts um, for a while, for a number of series, and we've started back up into this. And so before we dig in again, I'd like to pray one more time um, as we open God's word. Dear Lord, as you carry out uh, your presence, your power, your actions, wherever your word goes, so Lord, as we delve in and study and desire to seek you and learn more about you and grow in our relationship with you this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be here this, this time during our worship, during our praise, and during our study of your word. Father, I ask personally that um, you would help me, empower me, uh, let the words that uh, I preach be glorifying to you, to edifying to your people, and if they are wrong, to be corrected. And Father, we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. brief preview of our passage today, and we will, before I read it, um, I'd like for us to do an exercise. So Paul comes into a synagogue, and he is asked to preach, and he chooses to go through the story of the Bible. Now, if any of us were put in that position to talk about the story of the Bible, what would we say? I invite you to contemplate that. How would we describe it? How would we tell it? What points would we choose to include and what things um, would we choose to emphasize? How would we choose to describe God through the ways that those things are said? And to help us to kind of practice this, not just to think about it, but let's kind of put this in practice, let's make a timeline. So. The Bible has many, many things that have happened. Stories, events, people, places. And let's create a rough kind of sketch about the story of the Bible, of, of how this narrative has come together. So I'm gonna invite you, call something out, and I'm gonna try to put it into a semi-coherent timeline, and then we can get a picture and look at this, um, just in a way to contemplate the vastness of the story and, the, and, and all the complexities in it. So, all right, go ahead. What is? Creation, there we go, what a great place to start. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Moses. Moses, so let's see, we'll put, since the Bible's pretty front-loaded, we'll throw Moses right here, absolutely. Adam and Eve, they were created in the six days of creation. So we have Adam and Eve, the first people created in the garden without sin as they were born. Cain and Abel. So shortly after the fall has happened, Cain and Abel are relating to each other and we see the depths that humanity will go in their sin. Abraham and Sarah. So God seemingly for no reason chooses 
a man named Abram, to carry forth his word and his message to the whole world, and he marries Sarah. The flood. Put it right here. I'm glad I put this all the way over here. There's a lot going on here. (laughs) Noah and the great flood. God, so grieved at the depths and depravity of humanity, wipes them off of the face of the earth except for one righteous man. The fall. Okay, so we'll go here. Here we go. The fall. The time when humanity chose to rebel against God and get and come under the governance and the power of the kingdom of sin. Okay, what was the other one that I heard? The fall, okay. What? Job, there we go. So Job, I have no idea where to put Job on this timeline. Uh, seemingly, probably he happens somewhere in this area. So we're gonna kind of put him up here. Job, a man who suffered simply as a testament to his good faith in God um, and uh, a testament to how he was willing to suffer for the sake of God and not to curse and to blasphemy him. Yeah, much, much to be known in the story of Job about how we comfort those who are suffering. Solomon, okay, so we've got, uh, I heard the plague too, so Moses in, in, in kind of a subset of Moses we have I mean, there's many plagues that happen. I'm going I'm to say one of the plagues that happened there among the 12 miracles. So we've got, and Solomon, Solomon, the, the man who built the temple. Uh, we'll put him right here. Of God. David, Solomon's father, the king that was truly after God's own heart, the first king that Israel had that was probably worthy of being a king. Deborah, okay, now, yep, all right, and we're going to get right into this little thing. We had the judges, <laughs> and Deborah, before Israel had king, a king before they decided, we want to be like all the other nations, God gave them judges to help them live in a way that was worthy of their calling as a nation. Say that again? Esther, that's right, so Esther would have been... Probably out, even out, we're going to go over, yeah, we'll put her here. So Esther, the nation of Israel is in exile. There's a lot that's happened between David, this wonderful King Solomon, the peak of of kind of Israel following God and building a temple and glorifying him. All of a sudden now they're in exile out of their homeland and they need someone to faithfully serve God in the face of genocide. Okay, so we have the fathers. Um, yeah, some of the, the sons of Abraham and the fathers of Israel. Yes, so we've got coming over now into, into the fulfillments of everything that happens over here. We have a lady named Mary Magdalene. Interesting, what was her? Magdalene, I don't, I butchered that spelling. It's all right. Jesus, ooh, somebody really interesting has appeared on the scene here. Jesus, the fulfillment of everything that God, God's story of redemption in the world. John the Baptist, the man who announced the coming of the Savior. The one who was promised, the one who was expected, the one who was desired by all. Let's, so we have Mary, Jesus' mother, Mary and Joseph, mother and father of Jesus here on earth. The disciples. So Jesus, he has this sphere of influence of people that he is discipling. Mary Magdalene is one of those people who are his followers. He also has the 12 disciples who will be kept entrusted with the rest of the story going forward. King Herod. Here we go. Herod and Pilate. So we'll go Jesus, disciples. We've got Herod and Pilate. They're significant because they played a role in something that was incredibly world-breaking, which is the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus. 
why am I blanking on how to spell crucifixion? Um, Judas. Judas was one of the disciples who would later go on to betray him as the scriptures foretold. The wilderness. So there's lots of wildernesses in the Bible. Jesus in the wilderness. As he is going to be ordained um, for ministry, he then goes into the wilderness to be tested and to endure testing that shows him part of Jesus' ministry was an incredible amount of miracles that testify that he truly is fully God and fully man. Resurrection. Resurrection. So not only did Jesus die, but then he rose from the dead. And so we have hope that there is life after death eternal. We have the prophets, absolutely. So in here, we have this whole series of books going on with the prophets as they call Israel back to covenant faithfulness. They've strayed away. They're not following God anymore. And God gives them prophets saying, Israel, come back to the calling that you have been given. The exile to Babylon. Indeed. Exile. Daniel, many of the minor prophets. Indeed, so they go into exile and they come back to the promised land. To the promised land. All right, so Herod's temple and the Maccabees. So that would be, um, I'm not going to put Maccabees up here because that is extra biblical. Uh, But Herod's temple, right, so that was built... Oh, you're testing my knowledge here. When would that have been built? I believe that was built before Jesus' time. Yeah. Herod's temple. Okay. Yep, got the miracles. The ascension. So Jesus rose from the dead, and he then ascended to the right hand of the Father where he waits to come again to judge the living and the dead. Preaching the gospel. Pentecost was not before the ascension. It was after the ascension. Yes, okay. So then he ascended and he sent back the advocate, the Holy Spirit, in Pentecost. Pentecost. And Paul enters the picture. And then we have the ministry of the church. I am not in the Bible, but thank you for uh, John. The uh, John writing Revelation and maybe some other things. John is exiled to the island for being a follower of God. Okay, I think I'm going to cut us off here. But there's a we've put a lot down here, right? It's taken a, we've we've spent. 12 minutes just putting this together and this is far, far, far from, from everything that we read about in the Bible. So here's my, one of my questions that I want you to, to think about and contemplate as we dig into how Paul approaches this. How would you tell someone about this? How would you tell somebody about the, the story of the Bible? What are the things that you would emphasize in here? How would you tie it all together? How could you make it coherent? Indeed. Let me, let me, uh, but let me dig in into Acts chapter 13, and let's see how Paul did it. So, in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, we read this. So, Paul, he's been on this journey with Barnabas, this missionary journey as we've called it, um, as our kids are detailing for us. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them, that's John Mark, left them and returned to Jerusalem. And when they went from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Interesting, they just went to go attend worship. And after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, Say it. 
All right, here we go. So Paul and Barnabas, they're in the synagogue with people that they don't know. So they do know that these people believe in God. They do know these people are probably quite familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. But they have this new message. Everything that's happened from Jesus and John the Baptist and the crucifixion and the resurrection and the good news of all of this, how, how will they tell this word of encouragement? So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their inheritance, gave them their land as an inheritance. And all this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel, the prophet. Then they asked for a king and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found David. I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he? No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. All right, let's take a second here. So Paul isn't finished, but I want to kind of break down and, and point out what is Paul doing here. So he's getting this opportunity, and let's, again, to reemphasize the context, these aren't Gentiles. These people are Jewish people who are in synagogue on the Sabbath to worship. They know the scriptures well. They are familiar with the history of Israel. And so, so Paul, knowing all of this, drawing on their shared understanding, goes through the story, and he picks out a number of points of emphasis that all together, I believe, can be summed up in saying that God takes the initiative, and he is gracious with his people. Look with me. Let's look at this. So in verse 17, Paul continually points out how God did the things first. God chose the fathers of Israel, and he made the people great. He led them out by his power. He put up with them in the wilderness as they grumbled and resisted. He gave them developed land. He gave them judges. He gave them a king. He removed that king when that king went astray, and he gave them a king worthy of the throne. And then he gave them prophets to declare what God was doing in all of this time. And John the Baptist to announce that the Messiah, the awaited one, was here. Paul is emphasizing, he's setting up for the, the Jewish people that you see how God acts throughout the story of the Bible, throughout the Old Testament. God acts first. He takes the initiative and he is gracious with these people. He gives them things that they don't deserve. They don't necessarily um, even use all that well, but God loves them anyway. Even when they grumble and resist against them, he continues to love them. He continues to pursue them. He continues to draw them close to him. This is the God that they know. This is the God that acts. This is the God that brought them out of Egypt. The very identity of Israel is founded upon that. I've been trying to think of how do we, how do we relate this a little bit to how, how do we talk about this today. And, and I don't know if there is a good illustration, but maybe something that's similar is that uh, understanding that you get as you grow older and you move out of your house and you start to do things on your own and you look back and you, at everything that your parents did, the ways that they sacrificed for you, the ways that they brought you up, the ways that they fed you and clothed you and loved you, um, and you appreciate all of the work that they did a whole lot more once you move out. <laughs> Nation of Israel, they've... they've um, these people that he's preaching to aren't in Israel anymore. They've, they're kind of scattered across uh, the region. But Paul is emphasizing to them that God has acted time and time again throughout history. He has loved them. He has taken care of them. He has pursued them. He has taken initiative. And it is not by the actions of people 
that God's goodness has come. It has come because God has desired to do that. And so then he goes on, and in verse 26, he gets into the meat of what he's trying to say here. He says, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, those who fear, among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. Just as God has reached out and taken the initiative, so now he is taking the initiative again to come to you and to give you this message for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him or, nor understand the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. That is Jesus. And, through, and though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. God once again acting and pursuing and taking the initiative. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up from him, with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And for, as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God with his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. Paul has gone back. He's told about the work that God has done throughout the history of Israel, and he's saying God has done an even greater work now. Everything that he has been working and establishing and, and doing through the nation of Israel, he has fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the redemption that Israel was supposed to be for the entire world. And God is the one who made this happen. This wasn't by human hands. This wasn't by human schemes or division or, or, or whatever, anything, any action. No, God is the one who does this. And he calls on you to believe in it. Oh, all of the good things that God did for his people. We're pointing to what Paul declares here in verses 38 and 39. Through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. That is a big statement to make to the Jewish people. And then he gives this warning in verse 42, in which he says, Jesus is the fulfillment of, of what God has been doing throughout all of these ages. He did everything Israel was chosen to do but could not. He brought salvation to the world through the forgiveness of the world's sin. And now his challenge is for them to make a choice, to believe that God has continued to do the work which he has done throughout history and not to reject it. At some point in time in our nation's future, we've heard this predicted time and time again by scientists, by um, people who study uh, geology and the earth and different things like that. There is a super volcano in Yellowstone that is going to erupt. And it will be unlike any volcano that we have otherwise witnessed. And we don't know when it's going to happen, but when it does fulfill the warnings that it's going to erupt, the Pacific Northwest will be, um, to put it lightly, significantly changed for an entire generation. Pretty much wiped off the map. 
People know what's going to happen. They know the warnings are there. The scientists are saying this is what's going to happen. And so <laughs> when it happens, when it's fulfilled, it's going to be a, uh, a world-changing event, but especially for the people who live in that region. What Paul is talking about here, what Jesus is fulfilling, man, it's a lot like along those lines of the prophets, the law, Moses, everyone has been telling that there must be something more. There must be a fulfillment of this redemption that we are trying to achieve because we haven't been able to do it. And now Paul is saying this world-breaking event, this universe-altering, reality-shaking event has happened. And it's not just going to change life for a generation, but for the rest of time. Believe it. So, what happens after he says this? As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. Mm, interesting. And after the meeting in the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. That might be exaggeration, but it, it gets the point together. There's a lot of people here. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Whoa, this is some serious cognitive dissonance going on here. And Paul and Barnabas spoke up boldly, saying, It is necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so a lot happening here. They've gone, they've preached, they've given this message. Everybody's very excited about it, wants to hear more about it. But then when the time comes, whoa, fireworks. But let's back up and, and, and point out what God is doing in this passage before we look at what the people, how the people respond. God is bringing salvation to everyone. But Paul has promised what they are preaching he is doing. In, in verse 47 of this, we see a prophecy that God gave to Isaiah. I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And here it is happening. He has fulfilled it in Jesus and he is declaring it through Paul here. And in verse 49, we read that the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the region. Now, as a former tutor, this looks like really bad English. Obviously, he didn't write it in English, but even in the translation, this doesn't look like a, a very um, elegant way of writing it. Because when you're writing, you, one should always use an active voice, not a passive voice. Meaning, the bus isn't driving down the street, right? When you say, if you were to say the bus is driving down the street, um, you would be incorrect because the bus can't drive yet. But instead, you would write it as, I am driving the bus down the street. Someone is doing the action. The bus itself can't do the action. There is someone who is doing the action. So when, when Luke writes here that the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the region, seemingly it should be written that Paul and Barnabas were spreading the word of the Lord. But Luke, curiously doesn't say it that way. And he does this repeatedly throughout the book of Acts. He says, the word of the Lord was spreading. Because the word of the Lord is not an object. It is not passive. God is the force, the power, the action, the driver here. And wherever the word of the Lord goes, God is there acting. It is not Paul and Barnabas spreading the word. It is God himself spreading the word. Because God is the one who brings salvation. Just as he is the one who has acted throughout the history of the Bible. As we read the story of the Bible, we see time and time again, God is the one who acts first. And then we see it in the, the climactic point of this entire story when Jesus, that, who is God 
fulfills our redemption, and now God is bringing salvation to the world. And so, let's apply this to us for a second. Christ Church, we are not the ones who bring salvation to the world. God is the one who brings salvation to the world. It is not us, it is not legislation, it is not anything else that will bring people to salvation. It is God himself. Our privilege is that we get to be witnesses to what is happening. We get to declare about the way that God has loved, the way that God has acted, and then we get to act in the same manner that he has loved us so that everyone around us may get to see the light that we have embraced. That is perhaps the main point I want to bring out here before we get on, go on to another little section here that Christ Church, it is not our responsibility to save people, but we do get the privilege to tell people and to declare to them that God has given them and made salvation ready and available for them and to invite them to embrace it and to come and to be a part of it. It's a beautiful, wonderful message and a, a, it's a it's a continuation of how God has acted throughout history. So why are the Jews resisting? Why this big uproar? Putting ourselves in their shoes for a second. There's a lot of loss that is happening here. All change requires loss, and so the change that the gospel brings means there's a loss of status and authority and power for the Jews. They are no longer the only people chosen by God. They are no longer the arbiters of relationship with God. They are no longer the center of God's activity. And while this is fundamentally a good thing, this is a good change, right? Because the system that they operated in before couldn't justify them, and this one can. But the change and the corresponding loss that is felt feels like such a very bad thing. And so they not only resisted, but they actively sabotaged the work that Paul and Barnabas were doing. They stirred up the city against them. And this, honestly, this seems to be a common theme for humanity. We act in this way. We see this in our government we see this in our companies, in our families, and even in ourselves, that even though God offers a greater good, offers a better way to go about life, when something, when we are trying to change a system so that it better reflects the love that God has given us, there is resistance and there is sabotage. We as humans cannot overcome the pattern and systems of sin on our own. Thank God that we are not the authors of the story of redemption. That our redemption is not dependent on us taking the initiative, not dependent on us achieving salvation, not dependent on us to convince the others of the good news of the gospel. Because God does all of that. Which is why even after all that Paul and Barnabas endure here, being contradicted by their fellow brothers and sisters, being reviled by them, being kicked out of the city. Luke can note here at the end of the passage that they were filled with joy because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Even in the midst of trials, of tribulation, of resistance, of sabotage, of, of getting physically kicked out of a city that you were trying to declare good news to, they were still filled with joy because they recognized and they were filled with God's love and God's minister to them. And they recognize that it is not by our action that these people are saved. It's not dependent upon what we do. We know that even if we get kicked out, God will continue to act. The word of the Lord will continue to spread. And so now, Christ Church, I invite us to pray for the same. Dear Lord, Lord, as we seek to be your church, your witness in this world, we ask that you can instill in our hearts that it is not our responsibility to save people, so that 
still in our hearts that as we act, as we proclaim the gospel, as we tear down these old systems and these old ways of doing things within our lives, our neighborhoods, our societies, our cities, and point towards the work that you are doing, that we can be filled with joy regardless of the reception because we are filled with your Holy Spirit. So now, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Empower us. Let us go. May our words, our actions declare your love. And then, Lord, may you take our witness, these declarations, and may you spread your word in the way that only you can do. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And as a physical reminder that God is the one who is acting, we come to this table and we eat of the bread, we drink of the wine to know that God acted first indeed. In fact, Jesus is the ultimate expression of how God comes down to love us before we ever could possibly have loved him. We weren't even alive when it happened. And yet Jesus saw fit to die for us so that we would not be under the penalty of death and to come back to life so that we, and to share it with us so that we may have life eternal. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup and he poured it out, saying, this is my blood, poured out for you as a New Testament, as often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. We practice an open table here at Christ Church, meaning that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to come and to join in at this meal with your fellow believers. A couple things to note. One is that we serve both wine and grape juice. So the wine is the lighter colored um, drink on the inner circle of these trays. So please take what is appropriate for you. And secondly, we have been doing this for a long time, but our denomination has advised churches um, to do this and to proclaim that we are doing this, but our bread is gluten-free. And so if you are needing gluten-free, you feel free to uh, partake in supper with us. We do not want to exclude. We want to bring everyone to the table that we can. All right. Christ Church, the table is ready. Come and eat. Come and drink.
that after the service today we will be having a membership class so invite you to join with us and to be a part of that uh, process so but otherwise as you go I invite you and bless you and uh, yeah ask the Lord that he would grant you to go with the love of our Father with the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit but even so Maranatha come quickly Lord Jesus Amen <laughs>